Ladies and gentlemen, I'm come to today's Knowledge Group webcast, Data Security, Raising the Bar for Mid-Market CLE. And my name's Andy McLeod. I'll be your moderator for today's event. Without further ado, we'll hand things over to today's panel. I just want to point out, however, that over the next few slides, you'll see some information about the mechanics of our events, information about our participants and their respective firms. Now, also see the link to sign up to our Continuing Education Success Survey, where you can earn three months' worth of webcasts for a 10-minute phone call with our publisher. You can view your certificates, continuing education requirements, and much more using your account page on our website or on the go using the Knowledge Group app available for both iOS and Android. And on that note, if your firm is looking for a new way to help your customers manage their appointments, a custom low-cost app from Apps for Law Firms can help. You can email info at appsforlawfirms.net for more information. And finally, for those applying for continuing education credit, that is mandatory as a proof of attendance. I'll be reading six secret words at randomly selected times. You'll need to make a note of those and enter them into the survey as a proof of attendance. Now, before we begin, I'd like to take a brief moment to thank our sponsor, One Neck IT Solutions LLC, and our partner firms today, TDS and Alert Logic. Their information is on screen now. I'd also like to extend our thanks to our speakers for their time, help, and support in preparation for today's event. So let's introduce today's panel. We'll hear from Katie McCulloch, a Chief Information Security Officer at One Neck IT Solutions LLC. Well, Katie is Chief Information Security Officer at One Neck IT Solutions and has direct responsibility for information security, governance, risk, and compliance. And she manages the company's strategic IT security planning and compliance. And Katie validates that all One Neck services are built and managed according to the foundational security principles of confidentiality, integrity, and availability, and ensuring adherence to professional IT services based on industry best practice frameworks such as ISO, ITIL, and the National Institute of Standards and Technology and Cybersecurity Framework. And she also oversees a team responsible for mitigating information security risks and maintaining oversight of the company's compliance and certification portfolio. And Katie has been with One Neck for eight years and has more than 20 years of experience working with prominent managed IT security services providers. Jessica Bartley will be another one of our panelists, the Director of IT Security and Business Intelligence at TDS, where Jessica is responsible for leading a team of security professionals at TDS, a Fortune 1000 company and owner of of One Neck IT Solutions. She has spent the past seven years establishing an information security practice at TDS that focuses on securing information assets and company data, addressing risks of various threats to the environment and preventing and detecting potential security breaches within various companies in the TDS organization. And Jessica has more than 12 years of IT security experience and more than 19 years of hands-on leadership experience in a diverse set of information technology areas, including application design and support, server, network, and database administration. And Jessica is currently focused on leveraging analytics to enhance and improve security outcomes. Jack Dunny will be our final speaker in SVP and strategy and security at Unlearse Logic, and Jack engages with customers and the industry on company product strategy. And Jack is an innovative security technology leader with a proven success in creating, delivering, and promoting new security technologies and practices uh, to address critical needs. And he has founded and co-founded three successful security companies, holding CEO and CTO roles, and most recently he was CTO at Barclay, and previously at Quileve Technologies and Ounce Labs. And he's a frequent writer and speaker on security issues and has received multiple patents in a variety of security technologies. And prior to founding Barclay, he was the director of advanced security for IBM and has led the delivery of security services for IBM of North America. Before we do hand things over to our panel today, I'd like to give the first of today's six secret words. I mentioned that there were going to be six red randomly selected times. Here's number one, security, S-E-C-U-R-I-T-Y. So our first secret word of the day, one of six, is security. We're now going to turn things over to our panel on slide number 11. Speakers, over to you. Hi, everyone. 
Hello, everyone. Today, this is Jessica Bartley, um, and I will just walk us through the agenda, and then we'll head right into the presentation. And we will be um, kind of bouncing back and forth between each of the speakers, making this uh, interactive between the three of us. So you'll hear the different voices as we go through the presentation. Um, so our agenda today, we are going to start out by talking about um, the threat landscape that, uh, from each of the perspectives that we see across the various different organizations uh, that each of us are involved with. Uh, we're then going to review the, uh, do an introduction of the Center for Internet Security um, Controls. Um, we will walk through um, an example and a timeline of a recent ransomware breach that we have worked with. Uh, and then we will talk through how to leverage and apply so the uh, Center for Internet Security Controls to help reduce risk in your environment and to help mitigate the potential for a breach uh, like we are, are going to talk through. And so I'll head in on the next slide by talking through from a threat landscape perspective. So um, as was mentioned in my introduction, so I work for um, TDS and we are a Fortune 1000 organization. And we, as I thought about what we see from a threat landscape perspective, some key things that came to mind because we work across not just our thousand, our, our Fortune 1000 organization, but we also work uh, with various small and mid-sized organizations, um, emerging enterprise type of organizations um, in helping them implement security practices and responding in scenarios of breaches. And what, what occurred to me in thinking through this is that in reality, the threat, the threat landscape is very similar in many ways across varying sizes of organizations. And they come down to some key things. One, a key item that, that most of us in the security world are often uh, trying to work to defend against are user actions, for example. Um, and so this is a similar scenario, no matter what size of organization you're in, um, that we are faced with how do we educate our users on how to uh, not take those malicious actions, on how to be aware of what they're doing, understand how they are responsible for um, security, but then also recognizing that education is not enough and that ultimately, uh, as a security team, we are responsible for not just that education, but we are also responsible then for um, understanding user behavior and working to figure out how we can best mitigate risk of those user actions that they still may take no matter how much we educate. Um, as we look at, I actually just sat this morning um, with a group of uh, CISOs from various different organizations, and the topic that came up across the board that everyone was most concerned about is ransomware. You know, so I looked back at the past week of news, and here are some of the headlines, just as an example of why this is so far on the at the top of our minds, um, even in relation to again whatever size of organization you are. Um, you know, the the news from the last week was you know involved companies closing their doors because they were breached, um, a school system forced to delay their opening after the holidays because of uh, ransomware affecting their heating, their telephones, their classroom technology, um, a bicycle maker with 800 employees. So again, that's on the smaller side of an organization, um, 300 million in revenue. Um, ransomware was affecting their ability to engage with their customers and to deliver. Um, the city, city of New Orleans has been battling uh, for more than three weeks. Um, a ransomware attack, and they're just getting uh, the, their court system and police officers back and having access. Um, and then a currency exchange was also taken down. So that's one week of headlines. So that's not a month, that's a week. Um, and so this is a topic that, as I sat with a panel of, C, uh, of CISOs this morning, was at the top of everybody's minds of how do we best defend against this? How do we protect our companies? And I think that's a, a key threat that no matter what size of the organization, we're all facing. Um, and one of the areas that we have uh, at TDS focused on that uh, we continue to, to place emphasis on is really how do we get eyes and ears on what is going uh, on in our environment? How do we gain insight to the actions that people are taking, what's happening with our data, what's happening with our assets? Um, and as we'll talk through later, the critical security controls, um, the Center for Internet Security Controls, that's a key area, a key system that we have leveraged to try to help us gain perspective um, over that and if we're addressing all of the various different areas of security. Um, and one, one thing that I wanted to just mention is that as we, as we think about that threat landscape, one thing that occurs to me is that 
there's been a significant shift over the past even five years that it used to be five years ago, companies could get away with saying, we're not the big fish in the pond. They're going to go, attackers are going to go after somebody bigger than us. We're small. They don't care about what data we hold. Our data isn't as valuable as somebody else's data. Um, organizations used to be able to get away with saying that and have some safety in that. And today that is not true. Today, what we are seeing across the board is organizations of any size facing the same level of attack. And what is actually happening is a shift in the threat landscape that it's becoming more difficult to breach the larger companies and it's becoming easier to breach the smaller companies. Um, often that is due to just, frankly, the budgets that are different between the small and the large companies, the ability for the smaller or mid-sized companies to mount an appropriate defense. And so attackers have an easier time at this point often um, going for the smaller organizations, and we see that often with ransomware. And so a key thing for uh, executives to think about is, you know, how do you get the message across uh, to gain the support and funding in the organization that you need in order to ensure that the right steps are taken to not be the next one that's, that's getting hit with these headlines? Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Katie to talk a little bit more about uh, the managed service provider or mid-market um, threat landscape. Thanks, Jessica. So I'm Katie McCullough. I am with One Neck. As uh, mentioned, One Neck is a part of the TDS Holdings Company. So uh, Jessica and I have uh, frequently worked together on a lot of these issues. And from a One Neck perspective, uh, we really have two views of, of security. One is our own internal view, which as a managed services provider, back to the comment that Jessica made with all the reoccurring headlines, uh, managed services providers are front and center in some of those security headlines. So I wanted to talk a little bit about that perspective, but also to Jessica's point about uh, the mid-market companies we work with and what they're uh, currently experiencing. So let me start with the managed services provider. So as one neck, we provide data center facilities, uh, cloud hosting, and managed services all, all the way up to the stack into ERP. So uh, we are very trusted by our customers, and with that comes a uh, amount of security risk. Um, now the good thing about our environment is um, our our managed services environment is all about the infrastructure. So we're not a typical corporate environment when it comes to those infrastructures. So we don't have to worry about a lot of direct in, end user interaction. That being said, we do have, you know, hundreds of administrators that have to get into these environments. And so the layers of security protocols and controls we need to put in place is still very significant, obviously, because back to Jessica's point, um, Attackers are, are going to be opportunist, uh, opportunistic, right? They want to go for the quickest return on investment. If they can get into a managed services provider, then uh, they have access to all sorts of customers, right? So we have to be incredibly protective of that core uh, system. And again, we do that through various controls around our network boundaries, Certainly our access methodologies with things like MFA, although you're even hearing more and more in the news where um, that can be uh, attacked in certain ways. So this is where we constantly have to be ahead of, uh, of what those attackers are looking at. Um, and in, from an, another perspective on that, you know, on a weekly basis, I'm having conversations with our customers about what they're concerned about in our environment. Um, just yesterday, I was responding to a customer about CloudHopper. CloudHopper has been out since 2016, and there's just been, again, kind of bubble up of news uh, with some APT10 uh, activity, and they want reassurances that, you know, we aren't, we aren't see, having any experiences with that in our environment. So that, that's really a constant for me is reassuring our customers um, that we aren't seeing anomalous tra traffic and or what our controls are in place to assure that things aren't happening. Um, you know, really probably the biggest thing we deal with, certainly on a daily basis, is uh, distributed uh, denial of service because of our um, internet service that we provide through our data centers. So um, it's, it's pretty much standard operating procedure to deal with situations like that. 
typically they aren't big enough to be of much concern, um, but we have had experiences over the last couple of years where they have been significant and we've initiated redirection protocols uh, to help with those. So again, what we're gonna feed into is around those uh, critical security controls. And for us, that is a, when I talk to customers about what we're doing for our own systems, that is a, a strong basis and system that we use to assure and give customers our co confidence that we're addressing um, the threat landscape that we're dealing with from a managed services provider. Um, then the other opportunity I have is dealing actually with what our customers uh, may be experiencing. And to Jessica's point, um, it's no longer, hey, I'm going to target somebody because I want to make, um, you know, I know I can uh, make a lot of money from an attacker standpoint. They're going after opportunistic. They've got automated scripts. They can just blast out across the board. And whatever is easiest to get into, uh, they're going to start seeing how far they can dig. And that has certainly been the experience we've had with um, several customers. And, and it's the age old, those attackers get in there. They're in there for months. We've had a situation where an attacker was in there since 2016 and didn't really have a uh, significant event in their environment until uh, August of 2019. So the attackers were basically in there for three years. Uh, just in, in, you could see where <clears throat> Uh, different activities were going on and they just kind of stopped because they either hit a wall and they found a, a, a different um, company that they wanted to spend time on, again, going at that quickest return and investment. And then somebody else would pick it up uh, based on the indicators of compromise that we saw in the environment. So it, it's really interesting um, uh, to, to understand all of that landscape within our, our various customers. And again, these are all small customers, small to mid-sized customers. Um, certainly we've seen some focus areas around healthcare in some of the municipalities that we work with. Um, but ultimately these guys, um, they're just branching out to whatever is easiest to get into. And so for our customers, it's really trying to educate them and, and help them um, be prepared for those situations or hopefully prevent them in any way we possibly can. And with that, I'll hand it over to Jack. Thanks very much, Katie. Yeah, we've noticed much of the same thing. And the perspective I'm going to give is based in what's happening across a broad variety of customers that we see as an MSSP here at Alert Logic. What you find out is that the actual concern associated with these various customers is different based on their size, right? The threat that they worry about in a much smaller company is really an existential one, right? The Small Business Administration here in the States reported a couple of years ago that uh, about 60% of the small businesses affected by a breach would be out of business in about six months, right? So those smaller companies, they view this kind of damage and this kind of threat as really an existential. Um, when you look at mid-sized companies, right, they, this really becomes a question of cost. Um, the capability and the staffing some, sometimes isn't available to them to handle the cleanup and the planning, what have you, associated with what goes on inside a breach. And so that mid-tier customer is very concerned with the impact of cost. And as we get to the larger organizations, particularly the largest organizations, it's really a question of complexity. It's hard to understand all the exposed areas of the threat surface. And as a result of that, it can become extremely complicated to try to figure, figure out uniform practices, uniform policies, uh, to provide that protection. So I want to talk a little bit about is um, the, the, the really changing nature of the threat landscape as a result of the increasing sophistication of the attackers themselves, right? We know, and we're going to talk a little bit about ransomware today, but we know that, that ransomware has become a really straightforward way for the, the bad folks to monetize the capability of breaking into systems. Um, oftentimes, I try to help organizations understand that what has happened in the case of ransomware is it's really created almost a perfect crime. Um, if, if you think in the real world, uh, in much the same way as we think online, uh, in the real world, the perfect crime is profitable, right? And it is one that's relatively simple to execute, and you're unlikely to get caught. I, I can't think of three better words to use to describe ransomware, right? It's really very, very straightforward to execute. You can even go so far um, as to use ransomware as a service platform, right? So the proliferation of the technology is not going to be bound up by some, some form of complexity. 
You know, it's profitable. It costs almost nothing to execute these widespread automated attacks. And so what we end up seeing is that they're extremely profitable for the folks engaged in. They need a very low take-up rate in order to make it worth their while. And the advent and the use of cryptocurrencies, which really started about 2013, really coincident with the rap most rapid rise uh, in what happened in ransomware uh, incidents and events, um, that showed that there was a way in which they could be paid for the badness that they were doing uh, in a way that was almost completely anonymous. And so we see ransomware exposed, exposing this, this triad, right? The, this capacity to create a simple crime that is profitable, uh, that you're not going to get caught for. And so we expect to see it continuing to grow. And depending on whose data you read, who you talk to, um, the figures run anywhere from $10 billion to $75 billion in losses uh, over the course of the last 12 months. We know that the FBI has reported that they believe that roughly $1 billion has been paid in ransom. Um, we also know that the growth rate is expected to be somewhere between 35 and 60 percent. So, you know, this is a really complicated space, and the threats themselves are changing quite a bit. One of the reasons why I think that this discussion today around the CIS um, practices and the controls is because it allows us to bring some uniformity and to bring some measures. You know, one of the, one of the critical steps in being able to understand how to do the right and balanced level of security inside your own environment is to be able to do two main things, right? One is to be able to prioritize. Um, and again, the, the data shows us that a majority, it's almost 80% of organizations are expecting to spend more on their security budgets in 2019, 2020, right? And if I look at that, how does one decide where to spend, right? That kind of statistic tells us that people are trying to do more, trying to do the right thing, but you need to find a way in which to prioritize, to identify gaps, to understand better how you can improve. And I think some of the data that we're going to be talking about today will help us to achieve you know, some of those conclusions. And as you're proposing it, right, as internally you're trying to figure out what am I going to do, you also want to understand what are the metrics I'm going to use to measure. And if I take a step back and I look at the controls again, they provide these unique and excellent opportunities uh, for being able to create a measurable entity so I can tell whether I'm getting better or whether I'm not. Uh, a little bit more on the, on the sort of the threat surface that, that we've heard a bit about, right, and again, um, supporting more than 4,000 customers in security, right? We see a lot of data. We see petabytes of data. We see all kinds of um, information flows. We see all kinds of threats and right as they're coming out of the box, even sometimes before they're, they're being actively exploited in the wild. Um, but we get a lot of questions, right, as you would expect. Um, I, I'm going to give you a good example of a question that's popped up very recently. The current geopolitical stresses and conflicts and friction are causing customers to worry, right? There's been a lot of news lately predictions lately that we may see widespread cybersecurity incidents and attacks. So naturally, we get questions about customers. Um, I'll tell you, I think what it does is it highlights a change in the nature of the attacker. Right? Um, if I look back at a really prescient example, which would be the NotPetya attack uh, from a couple of years ago, one of the reasons why it was so damaging and why it spread so rapidly was it was specifically designed to do one thing, which was to attack a single you know, nation. Um, but the way in which it was written allowed it to spread laterally and to identify more vulnerable systems in a way that was really indiscriminate. Right? They were allowed that 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 system looked around and I think of it as a scan and spray uh, sort of spread. Right? It looked around. It looked for systems that might be vulnerable, and almost regardless of where they were or what they were doing, they got infected. And so when I look at the increase in attacks which are successful against the small and mid-sized businesses. Sometimes it's not necessarily that they've been intelligently targeted uh, in the way that we've described. Sometimes it's because the collateral damage, right? If I spread something around, I say, show me every house in the neighborhood with an open window. Some of them will be awesome houses that are great to break into, I guess. And some of them will just be a regular house. But if the window's open, I'm going in. You know, and so we want to make sure that we use these controls as a mechanism through which we can have a consistent discussion with folks, regardless of their size or sophistication, so that we can understand a common language uh, around the security that we want to apply, because the provision of that security is going to be very, very similar, almost regardless of the size of the organization. So threats rising. Um, we see the automation of attacks changing the nature of it. But I will tell you that as we talk to these controls today, and specifically some of the controls we're going to highlight as a result 
um, of the work that we're going to discuss in terms of the ransomware, um, I think what you're going to find is in just this description of the problem, some of these controls are going to pop up. And we're going to spend some time, the three of us, talking about how they apply. And I think what you will find is you can relate those techniques, those controls, with the statistics associated with the breaches that we're seeing, and maybe with some of the challenges you're having internally yourself. And you'll probably be able to see relatively quickly uh, where the value is for understanding better how to apply this technology and understanding better what kind of role these controls and the rest of the controls in the CIS framework can have to you. So that's what I got. And what I'd like to do, right, the, the right thing at this point in time um, would be able would be to pop this discussion back um, to Katie because we're talking about CIS, right, and we're trying to understand the role of those communications. And I think it'd be really a great idea to sort of set the stage because some of you may not be that familiar with the CIS controls, and Katie really is and has a lot of experience in this space. We should probably talk a little bit about that from a level setting perspective. Thanks, Jack. Andy, next slide. So just as we're moving the slide, apologies, Kate, I just wanted to come and give two secret words. So our second secret word of the day is domain, D-O-M-A-I-N. So secret word number two is domain. Secret word number three is system, S-Y-S-T-E-M. So secret word number two, domain number three, system. We're going to return things to our speakers. This slide's been moved, but back to you and apologies for the interruption. Yep, thanks. So as uh, myself and Jessica and Jack have talked about, there's a lot of bad in the world. Uh, and certainly we, we started to broach this topic about what you do about it. And for us, and as it was introduced in my title, right, we deal with a lot of controls and a lot of frameworks. And certainly none of them, all of them ha have play an uh, incredible role in helping people secure their environments. I know for us, uh, the CIS controls help in a in a couple ways. One, it's it's a level set for our customers so that they understand the framework we're using, and that it's something that's broken down into fairly simple components. Uh, they do get more and more mature as you get into them, but the reality is, is you can have a pretty fundamental, easy conversation about what they are. And then we also use this um, to actually talk to our board about the security we put in place. So again, you don't necessarily have to have a deep dive knowledge of security to understand fundamentally how some of these work. But for those of us in security, it gives us a framework to talk about uh, to other folks. And it really helps drive a maturity um, for ourselves, for our own organizations. And it's ever evolving, right? So this is uh, the critical for criti the critical security controls are global industry best practice. Um, it's it's a a volunteer uh, firm that works together with anybody that's willing to participate and they have a huge uh, volunteer organization that come together on a regular basis to understand what is what is the attack landscape looking like and how do these controls need to change so it's not, us as a necessary individual security folks having to research this and come up with our own plan, we've got thousands of people helping put this format together. And again, these are general guidelines. I'd say they're pretty uh, consistent and, and valid to work from, but you may find for your own organizations, like I explained earlier, with our own infrastructure, some of these didn't uh, apply as directly as others, but they're still it's still a worthwhile exercise to look through these controls, understand how they apply to your environment. Um, and then it really lets you focus on, because uh, again, we all know we're gonna have limited spend to be able to put towards this, where the biggest needs are, where the biggest risks in your environment are, and focus on that and really helps you prioritize that spend that you're gonna do. And so what we want to do today is, is use this framework to talk about some of those real threats, but how it directly addresses it using these uh, individual controls. Um, I will also, with the next slide, Andy, um, being forward, talk about, again, the, the critical security controls are there to try to break it down to make it easy for folks. And you, I encourage you to go out to the website. They've got a ton of information that that will help give an overview on this as well, so that you can inform either your leadership or your teams about how, what the basics are. But again, they're gonna break it down so that you don't have to boil the ocean 
in trying to fix everything that you may think is needed to be fixed with your security program. It really helps guide you through that, looking at are you a small, a small business, and if you are, look at this implementation group one, so it's typically targeted where there's not a lot of regulated data that you have in your environment, um, but it, no matter what, it's a starting place, right? So they break down the controls even further on what you should be focused on as a small business. And then either from a maturity standpoint or as you go into larger organizations, you get into more of that implementation group too, which certainly has many more controls to consider. Um, starts to, uh, you know, deal with sensitive data, uh, potentially even uh, legislated data that you might need to be concerned about. And in this day and age with all the various legislation being passed, uh, more and more companies are falling into this group to be able to uh, assure that there's proper security and privacy around their data. And then ultimately getting into that implementation group three. And as uh, Jack and Jessica talked about, right, these are certainly a Fortune 500 companies where they've got uh, dedicated staff and they can focus on these things. And that's where as, as one neck, we have the benefit with having a parent company like TDS that has that maturity level in implementing all the way up to this group three status in with a additional maturity around it. So we are going to do a deep dive on the whole framework, but uh, I think it's important, again, just to do a quick primer that it exists. If you don't already have something today, highly encourage you uh, reading up on it more. And uh, well, this is the framework we'll use for the discussion going forward as, as we talk about different uh, breach scenarios. Yeah, and I think that what, what, what Kate has described is really important, uh, specifically when you start thinking about the way that these implementation groups, and if you think about them as the breakdown of controls a little bit earlier, help us to better understand the way we can prioritize to do what we can to get the most value, right? One of the most important concepts in security is understanding where I'm going to get the most security return for my investment, and so I don't overinvest in those technologies that I know well. Um, organizations like OneNEC, like TDS, who actually have the experience and understand how to make those decisions and do it at a much larger scale can be really useful sources of information for mid-sized and smaller companies because they can apply the research that they've done and the value that they've seen to problems at a smaller scale. Uh, let me give you a really quick example, if that's okay, just talking a little bit about uh, specifics on some of the, the stats associated with these, these controls. You know, um, a lot of folks are taking time and, and moving, transforming the, their organizations into more cloud-facing organizations. And whether we're talking about uh, the AWS team or Azure or GCP, there's been a lot of work done to define the shared responsibility model, to understand where does the responsibility of the infrastructure provider end and where does the responsibility end. Um, and CIS actually has controls, uh, which are subsets of some of these controls. Um, that talk about the way in which things like the configuration of those setups uh, can be maintained effectively. But if if you look at the statistics, right, there were all kinds of data. You know, the the, the breach was a big one. Uh, Cat one breach, rather, excuse me, was a big one. Um, talking about the way data gets leaked out of poorly configured buckets, etc. But controls like this, right, implemented with the right priority, can help you to better understand and better have visibility into where those vulnerabilities may exist inside the system. So there's a very practical value that can be had at looking at these controls, uh, and it starts with a practical understanding of perhaps where you have your biggest gaps, uh, where you have uh, your most valuable assets, or where you think you're most likely to be impacted based on the way that things like network connectivity works or so. So as we go through this discussion, uh, I think that the Cadis description of the controls is really an important one. Recognize that this is a framework that you'll apply uh, as is appropriate in your own organization. And sometimes you'll be looking to other folks for a little bit of help in terms of understanding work. Great, so if we move on to the next slide. So what I wanted to go into before we actually hit on a timeline and an example of some ransomware um, is a focus on one of the things that we really appreciate about the um, Center for Internet Security Controls um, at TDS is the fact that it doesn't just focus on uh, technology and tools. And so as uh, Katie and Jack had mentioned, um, you know, we, we all know security is a complex topic and it's tough to, to, to break it down in a way that 
you can easily communicate about it. You can get on the same page within your organization about it. And that's one of the key things that the um, these security controls have helped us be able to do. Um, like they mentioned, it's that common language, that common understanding of what we're trying to go towards um, that has has allowed us to really be able to successfully communicate within our security team, but then also to our executives. And one of the things that we have felt has been very successful about leveraging uh, this framework for our organization has been the focus on process that's within the framework. Um, so many organizations go ahead and they buy various different tools. You know, they buy the next gen AV product, they buy logging, they buy SIM, uh, they buy CASBs, they buy all of these tools. Um, to try to reduce risk in their environment, and a big gap that they are end up that they end up left with is the process going the process to successfully run those tools and to successfully monitor, um, keep eyes on, and then take action on those tools. And what is very beneficial about the way that these controls work in the critical uh, the Center for Internet Controls catalog is the fact that they actually focus on what process you need to have in place or what, what you need to be doing to ensure that that threat is minimized. Um, and as Katie mentioned, and as you'll, you'll see in our example, um, we see scenarios where uh, attackers sit in organizations for months, uh, for years at times, and um, oftentimes those organizations are uh, have the tools in place to be able to see what is going on in their environment, and they fail on the process side. Um, and leveraging this catalog of controls is a key, that's a key uh, method that you can use to help reduce the risk by ensuring that you've got that proper focus on the process as well. So if we go to the next slide, so we'll actually talk through here an example of um, a ransomware event. So this is a situation where uh, we were called in, one neck was called in, um, to provide incident response and forensics services. And we leverage this as just a general timeline of events to, to, set it, to show an example of what realistically happens and occurs in environments prior to the activity of actually dealing with the security incident. And so in this example, um, and I'll give you kind of dates associated with and, and even hours and minutes here. So January 2nd, um, uh, TrickBot banking trojan was detected on an endpoint by an AV solution. So this was a standard AV product. It was not a next-gen AV product or more one of the more um, advanced products. It was a standard AV solution. Um, the product itself attempted to, to thwart and uh, uh, remove the infection, um, but it was not able to, move, to remove all of the files. So by January 3rd, um, TrickBot had spread, even though the AV product had detected it, that piece of malware had spread to the startup folders of every system in the environment. Um, it had spread to every user-based system in the environment. What occurred then was ultimately, again, we, we looking back at forensics, we could see that the AV product continued to try to clean it up, but continued to miss certain files, which allowed that piece of malware to persist in the environment. By January 18th, a uh, local user account was compromised. Um, this local user account then allowed uh, the attacker to continue between January and April to collect data on the environment. And so ultimately what they do is they did here was they sat in the environment and they gathered intel. So they looked at you know what systems are used for backup, what type of uh, OSs are being run in the environment, what different uh, servers are being accessed frequently. And what this gives them is the ability to understand what the most valuable assets in the environment are. Um, ultimately then, April 18th, a domain admin account uh, was compromised uh, when a domain admin actually logs in. Um, this was then used to spread the actual piece of software that uh, spread the ransomware or that encrypted the files, which was Ryuk ransomware. And within 21 seconds of that domain admin compromise, um, the ransomware uh, software began encrypting. And it started with the most valuable systems. So from an attacker perspective, if they can take out, again, especially when it's ransomware, if they can take out your backup system first, 
that is your their first step to stopping you from being able to recover without paying them. So they will often first go after things like your backup system, your um, Active Directory or whatever other directory services type system that you're using, um, your uh, email to prevent ability to communicate, you know, they're, and then they're going to go after things like your high impact servers. So if there's a system that the majority of the company is, uh, is utilizing, in their time that they are collecting the intel, that's what they're going to look for, is where are their high, high numbers of connection. Um, they're going to look for scenarios where there's potentially sensitive data that they could gain access to and encrypt. Um, because obviously the thing that they're going after is to try to inflict the most amount of harm in order to require a ransom payment. And then ultimately, after that 21 seconds started, um, it was with, it was in a matter of hours. I've got four hours listed here. I think it was actually closer to three hours that almost every single server in the environment was completely encrypted. And that included all backups. And so, um, you know, in, in uh, most scenarios, we would always recommend having an offline backup that is not accessible. Uh, a lot of organizations do not have that. Um, and so if, if you do not have that offline copy, it's very difficult how you know to recover as soon as those backups are encrypted. Um, and so then uh, the other uh, scenario that we saw occur here as well was that the majority of this activity occurred off hours. Um, so again, likely in that time where they were gathering intel, they were also looking at patterns of traffic in the organization and seeing that, for example, overnight, uh, there is less activity, which means that the likelihood of some, somebody being able to detect that something had gone wrong um, or that something was encrypted or they couldn't access a file appropriately, that's minimized. And so the ability to alert um, during that time, unless you've got systems set up to alert, the likelihood of a user detecting that and being able to uh, report it and then IT being able to respond to it is minimized. And that's a part of the intel that they gather. Um, and so within an, um, a few hours, uh, the, uh, like I said, the, the uh, servers and, several, and various different endpoints in the environment were encrypted. Um, and then in that state, an organization is left with a, how do I recover? Or frankly, do I pay in order to recover? Um, and so, um, you know, some of the, the things that we think about in a, in a situation like this is, you know, in this case of a scenario, again, because those backups were encrypted, if you're in a situation where those backups are not offline and you don't have an inaccessible copy uh, by, you know, an attack that the, the attacker can't get to, um, ultimately what this led to was months of activity to completely re rebuild systems, piece together ways to try to recover whatever data could be recovered. Um, and ultimately try to recreate systems in order to get the company functioning. And this is where, um, depending on the size of the organization and depending on their capabilities for recovery, this is where some organizations wind up being put out of business because they do not have the resources to do full rebuilds and full recovery like this. Um, and ultimately, what, what most organizations are left with is the fact that ultimately the cost to prevent this type of a situation would have been significantly less and ultimately less impactful to the organizations and to their customers um, if the organization had focused on prevention instead of recovery. Um, but a couple of things that I want, want to point out, um, challenges for organizations that are uh, in the, you know, the smaller to mid-sized or even emerging enterprise um, state. Um, oftentimes they're in a situation or in a scenario of having the IT systems in their environment that put themselves at risk. So they have the, the, the type of asset, the type of system that an attacker is, is ready to compromise, but they often don't have the IT knowledge, the IT staff um, to, to even recognize that risk that they have. And so oftentimes, and again, depending on the size of the organization, um, a lot of these smaller businesses may have a part-time IT person or they may have a, just a couple of IT people. Um, but oftentimes the organization does not actually understand the potential of the risk that they're facing based on the systems that they have in their environment. Um, a lot of organizations we still see think that it won't happen to them. Again, they still think, 
uh, you know, we're the, the small fish in the big pond, they're not going to come after us, or they think, you know, even even things like, well, we've got cyber insurance, it'll cover that. Um, it, it does, you know, yes, if you're in that situation where you have taken out um, cyber insurance, depending on the situation, it may cover uh, these activities. Um, they still cost a significant amount of money, and they still cost a lot of impact to the organization when it comes to reputation and being able to serve the customer. Um, and then ultimately, organizations, you know, in the smaller or mid-size often struggle um, to really make the case to be able to get the funding that they need or even or to struggle to understand how to make that case to get the funding. And that's one of the things that uh, we also believe and will walk through in more detail is how uh, because the uh, Center Net for Internet Security controls can be understood in a more common language way. Um, and because they give you that model to be able to talk to and communicate to, it can be a very good model to help explain and to help an organization understand the true risk that they have in their environment and to be able to make the case to focus more on prevention instead of recovery after a breach. So I'll pause there and I want to open it up to Jack to see if uh, he had any other, I know he had maybe some examples to provide as well. Yeah, and I think it's important, right, to, to understand that this, this example, which has been, you know, really beautifully detailed uh, here in terms of the way that TripBot was used to get Ryu working, this is uh, an important sort of new combination as opposed to the way ransomware used to work. And it's indicative of the way that other campaigns like Emotet uh, work in, in the wild. So if we can take this up a level, right, and talk a little bit about this. So for those of you who aren't particularly familiar with malware and ransomware campaigns, what have you, a TrickBot's a mouse spam campaign tool typically, right? You you end up getting those attachments. So it's very much something that, you know, user awareness is helpful on, uh, gateway blocking can be helpful on, because you can prevent TrickBot from actually getting the foothold. And TrickBot itself is sometimes a payload and sometimes a dropper, right? So sometimes, Campaigns like Emotech will download TrickBot as one of the multiple droppers it will use, and sometimes TrickBot is the beginning, and it will pick up other things like right as a payload. Right, so you've got think about it as these components. You've got um, it's sort of think of it as an initial vector to get onto the system. In this case, through malware, it tends to be email. It tends to be email or fraudulent link clicks or what have you. So again, some of those user interaction kinds of ways in which you can affect the system. It installs itself, and then it acts as a multi-purpose tool of badness to go off and gather other information. Um, in, in the example that Jessica describes, one of the big things that this particular attack did was it stole credentials, right? We saw this uh, in one of the first major attacks was back in Nuttech in 2017, where it was a combination of an attack which then stole credentials, which was then used to, con you know, to attack more systems. Really, really an important change. Not just blasting out a ransom campaign, ransomware campaign and hoping folks click on it, but instead using the access granted by that initial uh, threat vector to go forth and gather credentials and let me pop onto those other systems as Jessica described. They were really valuable to making this an effective campaign, right? So that's, that's really one vector. Here's another one. Right? So many of you, I'm sure, uh, are familiar with the WannaCry attack. It was based on having no users Right, that your users didn't have any role to play in the initial infection for one. Because what it used was a remote uh, command execution exploit. There was a vulnerability in an existing piece of service software that was exposed because it's intended to communicate with the internet and say, hey, I'm here to connect you, come connect to me. Uh, but when it was sent the right set of malformed bits, it gave up control of itself. It did specifically gave up control of access and memory to the attacking process. So now I've got a situation where that first stage, right, that, that infection stage, doesn't even require a user to make a mistake. Instead, it takes advantage of an unpatched vulnerability, and now it's on the system, and you can sort of plug it in. It's going to go through the same thing Jessica just described. Right? In the case of WannaCry, um, Eternal Blue was the vector to get on the system. Then the installed level Pulsar, which, uh, which was a multi-purpose backend dropper, much, much like TrickBot is. And it downloaded what ended up being actually the WannaCry ransom. The same, the same attack vector, uh, Journal Blue, um, was used during the NotPetch attack, right, as, as the initial attack vector. Uh, and there was a separate piece of software uh, that was used to do that second stage, you know, credential thieving, et cetera, called Minicap. 
So, uh, you know, I think one of the most important things to take away from this discussion that Jessica's just walked us on uh, is the fact that there are stages inside these attacks. And one of the benefits to thinking about these CIS controls we're going to talk about is those individual stages give us opportunity, you know, through which we can disrupt and intermediate that attack, right, and stop it from spreading and causing the harm that we know it's capable of causing. Because the modern attack is many things, right? It's in multiple components, uh, and some of them, as an example like Emotet, are what we talk about as being polymorphic, right? So one of the reasons likely that this particular campaign, you know, was detected multiple times by the AB vendor, but perhaps couldn't have been stopped, was it may have looked a little bit different every time. A polymorphic attack campaign, there is a different executable running every single time it gets downloaded. Right? The dropper manages to change it enough so it's not recognizable, and so it's hard to make it go away. Sometimes if it's not a polymorphic campaign, these are largely in-memory campaigns. Um, the attack doesn't require an artifact on the system to run. It's not you know, running out of some XC or some DLL, but instead um, it is running through maybe the auspices of some script right, that gets executed inside um, one of the office products, as an example. Right? We see macros being used. And now the power of it exists in memory. Nothing to scan for, nothing to look for on the disk. Instead, it exists in memory. And so as these campaigns change their tactics, to get around the security mechanisms that we, they know we have in place, we have to be thinking of more and more ways in which we can both prevent those individual attack tactics from working, but also we have to make some accommodation for the fact that something might get through and we have to be watching. You know, I think that one of the most important elements of Jessica's description here is that in that four hour period, right, it was likely taking place when there weren't a lot of folks watching. Um, and, you know, if, I, if I'm thinking about it from my own perspective, you really want to be watching all the time. You know, we don't know what geography the attack is coming from, so I can't rely on them when they're coming from someplace 12 hours away uh, that they're going to be operating in a 9 to 5 East Coast time frame, right? Um, and so there's this, cons this need for a consistent view to watch for things as they're trying to do the collateral spread. Uh, and look at the timeline Jessica has here, right? We're looking at January 2nd, you know, through the middle or end of April. Right? That's, that seems like a lot of dwell time, right? I think three and a half months of dwell time. Sad thing is, uh, most recent reporting shows, I think the average dwell time to detection of an attack is 109 days. 109 days. So it used to be that ransomware was the easiest to detect. Why? Because the campaign would land, they would punch you in the face and would ask you for money. So guess what? I know I get hit by ransomware because it just asked me for ransom. Today's campaign, as this one describes as well, um, is a lot more subtle, right? It lives for a long time. It's gathering intel. It's gathering with the credentials it needs. And even if the ransomware part didn't work, well, this campaign already has users and authenticated credentials and the ability to get in and out and to try something new through that drop or trick bot. So it's just a much more dangerous, a much more nuanced, style of attack than it used to be, and the ultimate end of it may be ransomware, sure, but realize that in these more complicated, more sophisticated campaigns, by the time you see the ransomware notice, there is so much other stuff that's happened um, that you're going to have to go figure out how to unwind and how deeply you've infected before it can move on. And as we talk through these controls, you're going to see some ways in which you, know, you can establish some level of visibility into how these things could be happening, and more likely some breakpoints, right, where you could actually stop these things faster. So uh, it, it, is, it is a big and growing threat, and I really appreciate the detailed presentation from Jesse, because it allows us to look at how, in this specific instance, all these different components were used to the ultimate success. Yeah, and I think that's a key, you know, several points you made there, Jagger, key to uh, one of the things that we've seen significantly change, uh, you know, we've worked with various forms of malware, especially ransomware, um, over multiple years here. Um, and one of the things that has significantly changed is, you know, it used to be that ransomware would work by a user would click on, you know, something malicious in their email, uh, open it up, it would run a script. Um, and ultimately what it would do is it would just kind of scan the network and it would encrypt anything that that user had access to, you know, whether it was just open file shares or, but it ultimately focused on uh, but typically that one user account and what that user could do and access. 
Um, and what's really shifted is almost this patience of the attacker um, and the intel, you know, that the attacker gathers and sitting in the environment and looking, monitoring, watching, and then really working to hit where it hurts versus just hitting what's easy to access. Um, and I think that's what's shifted because we often get asked, you know, what's the difference? We've been dealing with, with ransomware for years. I mean, this isn't this isn't a new thing, but the methods and the mechanisms are new. Um, and we often get asked that questions about what's it different? Why is it uh, hitting the headlines in the news so much? Why is it, uh, why are people paying so much for this? Um, and it's literally a business, you know, that the attackers are running. I mean, ultimately they're making money at this. Uh, you know, they've advanced their, their uh, and matured uh, their business and evolved it ultimately to uh, the point where it's not just the simple things that they go after, but instead they use different methods and almost patience um, in what they do in order in order to gather the information to be most effective at what they're doing. So if we go on to the next slide here, um, one of the things that I wanted to point out um, was I, I took for this example specifically of ransomware in an environment, and I laid out all of the different controls that the um, CIS controls uh, within that catalog that would have applied to be able to prevent, and we'll go through these in some more detail, but I wanted to give this kind of one picture view. Um, these are various different controls along the way that if properly implemented, would have been able to detect and then prevent that action from occurring and then the cost of that malware in the environment. And so we'll hit on, I think, each one of these in more depth and talk through how they could have been applied. Um, but I ultimately wanted to point out, you know, in this specific example that I gave, um, the organization had, you know, they, they, they could have had knowledge that this was going on in their environment prior to this occurring. You know, the fact that the AV tool had alerted is a signal right there that something was going on. But what was missing in the environment, they had the tool but they were missing the process of uh, the maturity of actively monitoring that, actively ensuring that was on all systems, and then actively validating that it was doing its job of cleanup. And again, that's what we often see in organizations um, that uh, leads to uh, a compromise like this. And then ultimately, you know, after you've uh, dealt with the breach and after you're dealing with recovery, you're often dealing with questions like, um, was their data exfiltrated? Um, and if the organization, you know, does not have some of these other uh, controls in place, those can be some pretty tough questions to answer. And so we're going to go in this next kind of set of slides, we're going to go through and we're going to talk through um, each of these different areas of the controls that could have been applied that would have helped prevent a breach. So if we hit the next slide. Okay. So we, we think when we think about the ways in which the impact that we just described in that example right, could be avoided, it, it really starts off with what I think about as visibility, right? The control number three in the CSC is really about vulnerability. Um, but there's actually an even earlier control, which is related, right? Which talks about the inventory and control of hardware and software assets. Those are sort of like two of the first CIS controls that you'd want to take a look at. Uh, because oftentimes what happens is that vulnerability management may end up being focused only on what people think about those critical servers, those critical systems, or the exec's laptops, or the specifically you know set up instances inside the cloud that I care about. But in reality, the systems which are much more likely to be sort of out of date and ignored, neglected, and likely to be breached tend to be something else, right? They tend to be those systems which are not necessarily as tightly related to the critical core, highly visible company function. So one of the first things for you to consider as you're thinking about this control and about vulnerability management is first thing you want to do is understand everything that's out there. Because as an example, in the attack that Jessica described, those initial systems that got corrupted, those could have been almost anything, right? And some of the same administrators are going to be responsible for administering that print server, right, which may be an older underpowered machine that nobody really care about, and they're going to be the ones who are helping to address performance concerns in the new high-powered multi-CPU, multi-core units over there, right? 
But those credentials, when stolen, often underprotect, think about it, under vulnerability managed system, will then be useful for that spread that she talked about in the example. Right. So vulnerability management, I just encourage you to think about as starting with understanding all the assets that you have to worry about across the And now that you have that, now you can begin thinking about how do I prioritize using the controls? How do I prioritize and make consistent things like update and patch? Um, you're probably aware of this, but I'll say it anyway. Um, ordinarily, uh, typical organizations will take somewhere between 30 and 90 days to implement a patch on average. High priority patches may or may not um, be implemented more rapidly than that. We also know that ordinarily within 24 hours following the release of a new patch that has security fixes in it, we will see the first uh, operational exploits of the vulnerabilities which are described in the patch, right? So there's a at least a 29-day period on average where there's a known vulnerability across systems which haven't been updated yet because the patches haven't been applied. But this is reasonable. I know that sounds horrible coming from a security guy, but you have to understand that it's a business, right? If I tell you tomorrow morning as you're on your way to work that, listen, you know, your car is not going to pass inspection, you still got to go to work. You're going to fix the car when you can. You got to go to work, right? And so it's the same thing with what can sometimes be an overbearing nature of security people to say, listen, get all those patches done. You're irresponsible if you're not. Well, it's, it's not like that. Right? Businesses exist to serve their customers and to help people, and patching is an important part of making themselves safe while they do that, right? So one of the things about vulnerability management, one of the things you'll see embedded inside the control is understanding where the vulnerabilities exist that you have, and sometimes they will be patched, things like vulnerabilities and flaws inside the software. Sometimes it'll be configuration related. As I mentioned earlier, we see some of that inside some of the cloud. Right? But understand where you're vulnerable and what's vulnerable, and then prioritize what you're going to do. And realize that the fix in the vulnerability management scenario underneath this control isn't always go patch it or go clean that up, because sometimes you can't. Sometimes it's doing things like in installing mitigating controls, Sometimes it can be balkanizing systems off of networks or limiting access or limiting the roles that have privilege to do things on those systems. Uh, but it's really, really important for you at least to be making a conscious decision of how you're going to apply a vulnerability management strategy across the estate as new vulnerabilities appear, as you discover new things have gone wrong, and that you're actively engaged in understanding where you're vulnerable and where you're exposed. And Katie, I think you had some thoughts on this as well. Yeah, Jack, to your, your first point, um, where people, they say, oh, our key systems are handled, right? One of the conversations I frequently get into is, well, our external servers are patched, right? We maintain those so our, our perimeter is solid. We don't have to worry about it. But as we see with all these uh, attack vectors, they're, they're not looking at your external systems. They get in immediately to your internal systems. And so... You can't just segment it in that way. While yes, you could certainly argue external systems are some of the most pressing to get patched, it doesn't mean you can just ignore patching and keeping up to date those internal systems. And, and to Jack's point, even some of the things you think, oh, well, that system's not important. It provides a, a, a transfer point to have breaches happen, so they are important. But to, then the point Jack talked about, there are other mitigating controls, right? We get, and again, a conversation I have regularly with customers is where they can't patch something, right? The application won't allow it, and it's going to break, and their business can't function without that application. Absolutely get it. There are all sorts of mitigating controls, right? Certainly, uh, network segmentation, keep that system as, as segmented as pa possible. And I get all that cost money and, and time to architect that, but it, it is going to be worthwhile. And, it, and the more you do it, and the more you know you build that muscle, the easier it is to to have that kind of um, network and framework in place to put those systems and monitoring. But to to Jessica's point earlier, right? Monitoring doesn't do you any good if you're not looking at those alerts and responding to them. So it has to be a holistic approach. It can't just be a tool so solving your problem. But again, I think for for me, what I run into frequently is customers can't patch, and we get it because um, the a critical application won't run. 
but don't let the conversation stop there. You know, let's talk about mitigating controls uh, to help with that situation. If, if I could emphasize a little bit of what Katie just said and so that everybody gets it, that's a, that description that Katie gives of, you know, spending a little bit of time to understand how to segment your network, uh, not only does it provide that kind of containment that Katie talks about, but it can make the monitoring that Jessica was talking about a lot more straightforward. If you think about the sheer volume of data that happens on the network, I don't care how big your company is, it's enormous, right? And sorting through that and understanding, as an example, is something anomalous happening or understanding that there's a weird volume of data on the network, that becomes a lot more tractable if I've done a good job of breaking up the network so that you know maybe this is my retail store transaction subnet, right? So when the stores are open during the day, this is where I'm going to see a lot of traffic. Well, if I start seeing a lot of traffic there because I've adequately subnetted myself out or segmented that traffic, then I can actually look and say, wow, it's the middle of the night. Hey, nobody in the store right now. Why is there so much traffic? Maybe there's something automated going on in some system inside, and it shouldn't really be happening. So the case advice is a really good one, and it pays benefit beyond just this vulnerability management piece. It also can really help to simplify the tasks that you have as you're trying to understand and identify when something bad's going on. So I think it's really good. Ladies and gentlemen, just to give our next secret word, secret word number four is software, S-O-F-T-W-A-R-E. So our fourth secret word, number four of six, is software. And if you've missed any of our secret words today, you can send us an email, info at thenowledgegroup.org, and a continuing education coordinator will be able to assist. But for now, we're going to return things to our panel, and apologies for the interruption. Great, thank you. If we can move to the next slide. So the fourth security control is uh, deals with administrative privileges. And ultimately, as Jack and, and Heidi had mentioned when they were talking about voter, vulnerability management as well, um, and in my ransomware example, a key mechanism that attackers often use is uh, in order for them to be effective with their attack, they have to gain some sort of access in the environment. And outside of exploiting a system, their next step is often to try to see what type of credentials they can gain access to, and they achieve most success when they're able to get access to some sort of administrator's credentials. Oftentimes, it's going to be something like a domain administrator um, or, you know, what we would often say a super user in the environment, so somebody who's got a broader set of access than your typical user does. Um, and their goal is ultimately, if they can gain access to that, that's how they spread the ransomware, that's how they spread any sort of malware, that's how they get broader access to data. And in the scenario of the ransomware example that I gave, that was a key mechanism that was used that actually allowed them to really proliferate uh, the Ryuk ransomware in the environment and then successfully encrypt. And so critical security control number four um, goes into detail on process, oftentimes, even more than technology, again, process that can be put in place around privileged accounts to ensure that the ability for an attacker to leverage an account, to move within the environment, gain control over the environment, or take some other action can be limited. And so a couple of key things that this control talks about is, um, and again, it's very much centered on good hygiene around administrative controls. Um, so good practices around limiting who has access to privileged accounts. A lot of organizations, again, especially, you know, geared towards smaller side, um, uh, aren't necessarily looking at that. It's easier to leave if you just leave the privileges, the accounts wide open, when in reality, the key thing that needs to occur is that it needs to be very minimal who can have access to a privileged account. What they do with it needs to be controlled. And some key things that can help prevent the spread is ultimately doing things like using multi-factor wherever possible. So there we're getting into a technology piece, but leveraging uh, multi-factor in order for an administrator to actually log in and gain access to a system. Also ensuring that, um, and this is a little simpler to do, ensuring that uh, the channels for communication of those passwords are encrypted. And so ultimately that when somebody is signing in, that those credentials can't just be read in clear text. Um, also things like using accounts unique to each system, and then configuring things like alerts to validate when someone actually does log in, was it that, was it that person that logged in? 
Um, so there's quite a few different controls that could be put in place, but this is a really key and it's why it's geared towards the top, uh, you know, in the top uh, six of the CIS controls um, is really understanding and restricting um, how admin uh, privileges can be used because it is a key, often a very key mechanism of spread in an environment. I think one of the interesting things is, is you do that kind of maintenance, that housekeeping uh, that Jessica just described around your administrative accounts. And as you really force your organization, as you would force an application, to adhere to least privilege, it, it gives you a unique opportunity to identify when someone has stolen an account, right? Um, if I try to use anomaly detection in general, We've learned over the years, it can be really hard right, to watch a broad network and say, wow, this user is doing something odd, because users can be so variable and things change so much. Administrators aren't the same way, right? And so it is much easier to identify when something weird is happening associated with a privileged account, assuming you go through the good work that Jessica's just described. Really much more easy to understand when something's weird happening in admin accounts so you can see that there's been that initial point of infection. So if I see a privileged account attempting to do operations that it doesn't have privilege for, that's weird. If I see a privileged account from one network or from one service attempting to make changes to another one or to create, as we referenced here, a new account in some other place, then that's also a weird thing. And it, it provides me with really early indicators. And what you're gonna see with these, CS, with these CIS controls is sometimes, they're a great bulwark, right? They're a great preventative measure, but by implementing them, it gives you a whole rich source of data that can help you to understand when something's already gone sideways and stopping it as early as possible. But I think, and again, I think these are great recommendations and they give you, much like Katie's earlier recommendations did on the network, a way in which to have a much more fine-tuned understanding of when something strange is kind of happening. So if we can bounce to the next slide, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about some of the evidence we see of strange things happening. Right? Um, we know that the, the speed of networks and the sheer volume of data that passes through systems can make it hard uh, to, to look through it all right, and to understand everything that's happening. And this is one of the reasons why uh, control number six talks about taking a look at audit logs. Right? So there's going to be, I'm going to talk about two different kinds of logs that really matter to you as you're trying to think through this problem. Uh, and they relate to the way that the, the, the bad folks and their tooling tries to take advantage of things. So um, if, if you look through sort of the anatomy of uh, malware campaigns, particularly successful ones, they have some pretty common elements, right? The successful ones, number one, they look around to see if they're run, you're running any security tooling that can pick them up. Uh, and they, they try to do this first, and then they don't show their good stuff, right? They just don't run, right? Or they don't run until that process. Or they shoot that process, and they go and do the very thing because they don't want the record of what they've done uh, to be known. They want to eliminate the likelihood that they're going to be discovered. And in the event that they're discovered, they want to leave very limited evidence of how they did what they did because it'll help researchers figure out how to prevent it. Next. So there's that. Um, the second piece is, because a lot of these attacks, as we've spoken about earlier, are multi-component, right? They're gonna traverse the system in different ways across different networks, across different services. Um, if you're not doing a good job of maintaining uh, access to the information associated with those services or the rest of those applications, you can end up with blind spots. Oh, it jumped over here, there was silence, and then the whole network exploded, right? So you wanna make sure you're doing a decent job of gathering all that information. And so, Picture that first, right, at that basic level of functionality. It goes back to my, my earliest comments today about visibility. You want to be gathering the information from the variety of logs that you have access to so you'll have the fullest possible version of events um, if something bad happens, and also to use them proactively to decide if something bad is sort of in flight. Uh, because logs, right, think of them as the, the concrete instantiation of somebody doing something they shouldn't. And this is why we talk about them being secure and auditable, right? We want to make sure that those logs themselves aren't as vulnerable as regular data is to the attacker or to accidental deletion, because you're going to need these things when time goes by. So um, I think uh, when we were talking earlier about you know, good backups and good processes around that, having these logs contained someplace else, having perhaps a third party gather them and store them and analyze them for you 
really, really a very good idea. And make sure that these kinds of laws, even when it's associated with what you think of as rather sort of like typical service functions like web servers, what have you, are stored elsewhere with your backups, right? And they may not be your critical user data or your critical application system data, but they are critical if you're going to understand what's going on. The second piece is uh, make sure that that local attacker can't just bounce over there and go someplace different and make that data go away, right? Because a dedicated attacker, particularly in a protracted campaign, is going to try to make sure that there's as little evidence as possible that they've been there. If you get this broad level of visibility, right, if you're having all those logs and storing them in a place and, and, and having access to them, now you can start to use it in an interest. You know, one of the things we do at Alert Logic is we're looking across multiple different kinds of log sources because a, a, a modern attack is going to do all sorts of different things. I may see what looks like a potential credential theft on this system on prem, and then I see what looks like an unusual action in terms of some entity executing a role in a cloud someplace, and then I see some weird data exfiltration happening in the network. Well, because I'm gathering all those different logs together, if you're gathering different logs from different kinds of services, you can sew them together, right, and understand, and in many, in many times we do it with analytics, you can understand that something bad is happening because of what you see across multiple logs, things that wouldn't be obvious if I was just looking at the network or just looking at one application or just at one log. If I'm gathering these things and I'm doing this style of monitoring and analysis, described in this control, then I can actually take more benefit from it and, again, recognize bad things that happened uh, earlier. Uh, one very tactical thing I'd recommend to you to consider um, is that as you're thinking about implementing this and you're understanding that you want to gather all this log data, realize that sometimes it can be very peaky, right? It, it, can, it can be spurts of data and, and periods uh, where there's high throughput, high frequency data uh, provision. And so what we have found is that, you know, organizations which are concerned with this that have high enough bandwidth or throughput to worry about it, they tend to go to cloud-based infrastructure so they can hyperscale. You know, it, for those of you who aren't doing it yet, uh, there's a lot of information <laughs> that comes uh, in the logs associated with system services and security tooling in general, particularly if you're trying to do things like packet capture. So as you're doing this and you're thinking about this and you're recognizing the value, also recognize that there is sort of this infrastructure component of it that you want to make sure that you scale to gather all the information you need um, because this is going to be a key part to doing the kinds of analysis um, that folks like Katie and Jessica are doing all the time for there. And I think, Jessica, you had some thoughts. Yeah, so, you know, one of the things that I would say about this control is in our environment, um, we have placed significant focus in this area. And this has been one of the most important areas, not just for understanding what's occurring um, in the environment for forensics purposes, to be able to track or hunt something down, but also to garner more real-time alerting on situations that aren't occurring in the environment. So if I would say from a technology perspective, uh, uh, one of the key areas, and I'll, I'll talk about another one next, but this is one of the key areas where um, we have gotten tremendous benefit out of investing in um, some technology or systems in this area. Um, and a key thing that I wanna point out, you know, for um, you know, small to mid-sized or emerging enterprise organizations, you know, there are, as Jack mentioned, various different solutions available. Oftentimes when people look at a control like this, they think, wow, this is too big. Um, it's difficult to do. I don't even know what I look at. Um, I don't know that I can manage a tool like this. They often think about an all-out SIM type solution. Um, and what I would say is that Start with at least the basics here. You know, we oftentimes go into organizations that do not even have logging configured on their systems, you know, for the system to directly capture the log. You know, and while that is not the end state that we like to see, you know, companies get to, we like to see them get to that centralized point where the logs are being sent off of that system, um, at least having um, logging on that system turned on. You know, we oftentimes even see that it's not turned on on systems. Um, that can at least help. The challenge with that that companies quickly run into is the fact that the logs build in size, you know, quickly and can overwhelm, or they have to they have to purge the logs after a short period of time, and that's where centralizing comes in into play. Um, but this, by far, can be one of the biggest areas of where an organization can get insight into what's going on in its environment is by implementing this type of logging. And so, if we switch over to the next um, slide, the other area that 
uh, where organizations can gain significant insight into what's going on is by um, mounting better malware defenses, um, specifically through tools in this area. So, you know, historically, a lot of the uh, antivirus solutions worked purely based on signatures. And I think uh, if, if you know you've read much in security news over the last uh, chunk of years, um, malware uh, antivirus type systems have switched over to what we often talk about as being next generation antivirus. And so these types of tools um, are often able to detect and alert on different behaviors that are occurring in the environment that may be outside of the norm. And so they're shifting, these tools have shifted from just being able to alert on uh, a specific uh, signature of a specific piece of malware, which was a never ending battle to try to keep up with, to actually um, doing more in the way of monitoring and alerting on abnormal scenarios in the environment to be able to tell you that something different occurred than it, or something that a typical profile of an attacker was spotted to be able to alert and identify on that. But even if you are not able to step into a full next-gen AV type tool, um, a key thing that I would recommend, and as was seen in the ransomware example that I gave, many organizations have at least a very basic or have more of the basic antivirus tool. Um, and those are still good products. You know, They're not up to the level of what those next generation products are or the advanced malware products are but there are still products that can give some insight into what's going on. And so in the ransomware example that I gave, um, the standard AV product had alerted and had tried to contain and remove that mail, that piece of malware multiple times. Um, and just the, you know, I've talked about process a lot, the act of having somebody in your organization or somebody uh, that you partner with that can keep an eye and have eyes on those tools to ensure that action is actually taken that's appropriate when something is detective, detected. And that's often a state a, a situation where we still see organizations kind of fall down. Again, is putting in the tool, or a lot of them will even pay to put in the uh, next gen or the, the advanced malware protection type tool. And then they forget the part about the monitoring and they forget the part of keeping the eyes on the screen. Um, and then ultimately it almost, you know, it, it's, it's rendering that investment of limited uh, value ultimately. You know, and the good thing about some of the more advanced tools today as well um, is that they can not only detect, but they also have modules where you can actually block and prevent an action from occurring. Um, and so ultimately you, you can configure them that if it detects something that appears to be a malicious action in the environment, it can actually isolate that system or prevent that action from continuing in the environment. Um, and so again, you know, this is a scenario where there's a lot that can be done if you've got just the standard AV tool, as long as you're keeping eyes on monitoring it. Um, but then, you know, there are more advanced tools here and that's what this control focuses on as well is that the basic of, do you have the tool in place? I think Jack had mentioned early on when he talked about vulnerability management, the ensuring, and it's, it's the security control one in this framework, ensuring that you understand what assets are in your environment. So what hardware, um, you know, what servers do you have, what desktops do you have to ensure that you have full coverage on them and to ensure that you actually have tools like uh, an antivirus or next or uh, advanced uh, malware protection tool covered on all of your systems and not just part of them. Um, so that's a key part of what this control focuses on, and then ensuring you've got the eyes on the screen to validate that uh, you've uh, mitigated appropriately if something is detected, and then ultimately as well, um, looking at some more advanced features in some of these tools. I think that one of the added bonuses of doing the work uh, Jessica just described is that there is this aggregated capability Right? So if I do have even the simplest anti-malware tool in all my systems, and then all of a sudden I see you know, five systems out of 500 light up right, with the same kind of error, now I know that there's something more systemic coming against me. Right? I understand perhaps that the organization is under threat, or I recognize pretty quickly that there's an infected machine inside my network that's doing that scan and spread, right? that's trying to apply uh, a piece of malware across multiple systems. So again, I, I think that this level of consistency 
according to the control, uh, whether you're talking about you know, traditional antivirus or the next gen, which is capable of detecting things which aren't necessarily signature based, it can really provide you with interesting telemetry, right, about what's going on internal to the network. And it may give an indication that something worth detecting. Now, a lot of what we've been talking about to this point um, has been about de defense, right? It's been how do we block these things and keep things away? And I think it's time to move on to the, we know some bad things can happen. And I know that Katie's got a lot of experience in terms of talking through what goes on and how we manage things like data recovery. So maybe we'll go there next. Yeah, so uh, next slide. Um, Jack and Jessica gave me the honor of giving the uh-oh slide controls. Um, so <laughs> Hopefully, uh, very few people experience this, but we know in this day and age it's going to happen, so be prepared, right? Uh, I think certainly our recommendations in these situations is, is never to pay. I know there are situations where if you're a pure CFO, you might look at it differently, but there's real risks to that um, and what it encourages in, in the bad people that are out there. And, Again, just looking at it, that example that Jessica started with, it was four months uh, from the time when things could have gotten detected. And part of the challenge in that then is things like backups, right? So when we talk about data recovery, certainly data recovery plays a role in any kind of IT system. It is not uh, special to security. So this is where we have a win where we can, you know, really collaborate with the rest of the IT team because everybody wants their backups, right? Um, and, and again, most of the subcontrols associated with us are just good hygiene around your backups, right? Making sure everything is backed up um, and, and that it's accessible that you're testing those backups. Um, you know, the challenges we see with things like ransomware is if you've let the um, any of the indicators compromise sit in your environment for four months, years, right? you've just jeopardized your um, your data that you've backed up. So you've got to be aware of that and be prepared for that. Again, there's other controls. Um, if you're restoring, you know, if you do have other things in place, that once you've identified that there's ransomware, you can still stop potentially some of that data from being re-triggered if it's restored. Um, but ultimately, you know, you want to make sure your data is encrypted. Um, and, and Jessica made this point earlier, right? You've got to have your backups off of your network. Um, and any, any um, backup vendor worth its weight is going to have some protocol, some configuration that you can help do that with. Um, sometimes it's just paying attention to that and, and honestly clicking a box that says, you know, don't make this continually uh, addressable. So it's it's paying attention. It is you know really collaborating with the rest of the IT team again because backups are so important to the rest of the organization. But there are some specific security elements you've got to be aware of. Again, if any of those uh, if the data is is present for so many months, uh, you've got to be prepared for what that might look like when you restore it. And certainly, as in the example. Um, Jessica gave, we saw where the the bad guys are able to actually get into the backup system and even encrypt that data. So um, there are definitely some security elements that you have to be prepared for in that situation, um, but certainly nothing that should be out of the ordinary for an overall IT department. And then from there, I think we can lead into boundary defense. Excellent. And, you know, part of the boundary defense protocol describes exactly what Katie was just uh, alluding to, right, which is that you want to make sure that things like your backup go outside your boundary uh, because partially um, the attacker's success is going to be based on what, what they can access. So if we can move to the next slide, please. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about you know, why you know, boundary defense matters in this day and age, right? So. Um, Things are very different now than they were 10 or even 20 years ago, right, when, when some of us started out in this industry. Um, firewalls and strongly protected perimeters provided us a means through which we could identify uh, inside from outside. And a lot of the security technology that exists today is still sort of predicated on that inside and outside. And originally when this control arose, 
right? the, the discussion is how do I manage things at that boundary so I can have more control over what comes into my network and what stays on the outside with the implicit understanding being that security on the inside is going to be different than security on the outside. And I'm going to try to keep more of that out. And one of the things that's happened over the last you know, number of years, even before um, the advent of the, the cloud providers taking over you know, so much of people's infrastructure, uh, was that the perimeter began to dissolve. Right? We talk about it as the rapid deperimeterization for basic connectivity because there's plenty of syllables. Uh, but the idea is that the logical perimeter now sort of exists between me and the app I use. Right? I'm sure that all of you have organizations that you deal with, whether partners or customers, where they're reaching much more deeply inside what would have ordinarily be considered your internal structures or internal than they used to happen. So you want to think about boundary defense, right, in the context of the way in which you're sharing data and you're trying to provide access to the data to your partners and to your customers. And so, you know, number one, if things are too wide open, right, it's obviously the easiest for me as, uh, as an organization to say, hey, everybody, come get, get what you need. But that clearly is a problem, right, because it allows people on the outside to get unauthorized access and misconfigured buckets and highly privileged users, you know, get access to things that they really shouldn't. It just opens up an enormously wide and pretty porous threat surface. Um, the second thing is, uh, if I have relatively porous uh, external protections, it provides access to a lot of internal systems which may not have necessarily been developed or be maintained with the same rigor as the patch management will happen from an organization like Microsoft, right, who are going to have a patch choosing. They're going to do a good job of trying to make sure that I understand what should be patched to maintain security. You know, very few internally developed proprietary applications with small spread, spread of hosts are going to have that same kind of control and that same kind of rigor. And so by not understanding that boundary condition, by not limiting either logically or from a network perspective uh, access, I'm going to be exposing a lot of weaknesses that I don't want to see. And we, and we saw some of this uh, some recent so, I mean, you know, the ideas here are, number one, try to create uh, logical boundaries between the different kinds of network uses that we'll see. Katie did a great job describing it earlier. How do I do a good job of breaking this thing down so that I make sure that the networks contain only the things that are necessary? I, I talk about it as the network application of least privilege, you know, make least access something you care about, too. If there's no reason for some other network to have access to some other network, don't let them. Right, and you know sometimes this works in a, in a really straightforward way. Just start blocking down access and wait till somebody screams, particularly on the internal side. Find out you know who should be getting there because then to go back to or refrain up and harping on a lot today. Uh, when somebody tries to get through that and, and gets the failed access, it may give you an indication that somebody's trying to go where they should. Um, and this gives you again that boundary across which I can do things like pretty strong access control, or I can watch for badness happening or an inappropriate access happening, so my IDS can be monitored. Any kind of monitoring and alerting can be monitored. The, the boundaries themselves, because it's not just networks anymore, it's not just you know, trying to get across some from network A to network B, sometimes it's going to be about the applications, right? Should this application be talking to that application? Is that a weird boundary condition? You know, should someone who's busily using application A have access to application B, like Salesforce, right? Or is that something that's just unusual enough that I should ask a question? So think about this control uh, in terms of boundary defense uh, as a way in which to do relatively sophisticated things if you want to, like identifying people who are trying to overstep their bounds in terms of what they're trying to access to. Um, and also think about it as a very blunt force control, right? That if you have the capability and if your organization is clearly delineated enough, you can use this as a really smart and logical place to put more blunt force protection. So, you know, I just encourage you, it just gives you another opportunity to get some insight into the way the organization runs. If you're responsible for security, it gives you a great conversation to have with the organizations you're trying to protect. Um, but boundary, boundary definitions uh, provide you with a great way to do a number of things that will help you with this control. And, and Jack, I would add to that, right, for me, this control is a big one for security by design, right? Talking to your business units when you're putting in a new application is a perfect time to talk about what traffic should be talking to what so that you're not doing it after the fact. Um, with some of the advances with um, 
software-defined networking. Um, I know there's a lot of buzz with uh, zero tolerance networks and not that you have to get to those kind of extremes, but just, you know, knowing what needs to talk to each other when you're implementing something to me is a, a huge aspect of this, this control that you can get in front of. That's a fantastic point. And, it, and in fact, it coincidentally leads us beautifully into awareness, <laughs> which I think Jessica's yeah. going to talk about. Absolutely. So if we move on to the next slide here. So, you know, we've talked repeatedly just about user behavior and this is a key, you know, control. Again, it's it's control 17 um, in the catalog of controls. And in the example of the ransomware that I gave, that was a scenario where user behavior was ultimately the situation of what allowed that breach to start out. Um, so a user received an email, they clicked on a link, um, their device was compromised, you know, the malware was, was loaded onto their device, and then it spread from there ultimately. It moved laterally within the environment. And, you know, and this, this was a scenario where user, you know, the user clicked on something, they didn't report the fact that they had clicked a malicious link, so nobody was able to recognize at that time that they needed to take action on it. Um, and so, you know, this is a scenario where it's really important to educate. One of the things that we really focus on is educating your um, organization as a whole on the fact that security is everybody's responsibility. There would be no way that a security team in and of itself could be successful with protecting an organization. It really comes down to the behavior of each person and individual in the organization. And now obviously all of the, a lot of the rest of the controls dealt with, um, uh, you know, control or dealt with technology and processes to put in place to make up for a scenario where a user takes a, a bad action. Um, but in reality, it's very important and it's critical to continue to work to try to train and educate the workforce on what their responsibilities are. Um, and so there are various different good tools out there that allow you to um, focus on education for your employees, um, as well as, um, you know, the other thing that, that is very helpful is to do phishing simulation or fish, phishing tests. Um, and ultimately, you know, that allows you to uh, kind of run your user through some scenarios and, and kind of allow them to practice in a safe way, um, recognizing when something is or is not uh, malicious. And then often it allows you to kind of continue the cycle of education that if someone does click a link, falls for uh, a phishing, uh, a simulated phishing uh, attack, uh, that it allows them to then receive additional education to try to kind of beef up their their knowledge and just kind of some key things that we try to educate on is, you know, to, to teach people to use caution with the links that they're clicking um, and to make sure that they use caution when they enter website addresses um, to ensure that it's not a malicious site. Um, look for security on the website to ensure that it's locked, that it's encrypted. Um, even things like, you know, being sure that you understand, uh, you know, what you what an email attachment is and if you should have been receiving that and opening those with caution, forwarding, forwarding them on to uh, the IT team or an IT staff to take a look at those um, to, to validate if they are legitimate or if they are uh, false and if there is a concern with them. But really by far it's you know, trying to teach the users those basic good behaviors, um, ensuring that they understand how to report issues if they encounter them and that, we, that it's encouraged and, encouraged and not penalized to report issues um, that that's viewed very favorably, um, educating them about things like social engineering um, and ensuring that they aren't relieving out their passwords and their credentials, um, and just really making sure that they understand um, how much of their responsibility it is to protect the company. And with that, I will turn it over to Katie to then talk about when it actually, you know, if something actually occurs, how to handle incident response. Thanks, Andy. Next slide. So yeah, this is the final uh-oh control. So, uh, but in some ways it's uh, the control I love best because it has the, the tool that I love best, which is a checklist. Uh, something that you can create on your own, right? Most of us have some kind of incident, uh, whether it's due to availability of systems or whatever, have an incident plan, but it's just like the age old, Discussion where you want to you want to work that muscle plenty of times before you actually have to use it because you don't want to be uh, 
creating it in the moment. Um, so I highly encourage you. It does not have to be highly detailed, but just just walk through from the moment of, moment of you know what's what's it going to look like when you detect something, whether it's through alerting or an admin being on a server and seeing something odd. You know what are they doing to report that? Um, when you have an end user report something, who who's that information going to so that they can best assess it? And then once you've assessed something, what is your communication plan, right? All organizations have multiple layers, right? What are you doing to involve your leadership team? What are you doing to involve legal, right? A lot of situations we get involved in has regulated data, and you're going to want your legal team involved because there are special um, uh, protocols you're going to want to follow to to help limit the any kind of damage or concern in those situations. Uh, is HR have to be involved? Um, and then, you know, a big one for us is our customers. What is going to be your customer communication? Be prepared for that. Don't wait to the last minute to understand how that's all going to play out. Um, so, so think through your communication and notification. Put it in a checklist so you're just running through that checklist. Um, at One Neck in TDS, we go through a yearly crisis communication plan where we pull all our leadership into a room. And we go through an exercise of, okay, here's a scenario. What are we doing? And uh, we walk through it. We spend nearly half a day walking through it. We get all sorts of after action feedback. Um, so it's an incredibly important part to get it documented and then test it on a regular basis. Um, make sure it includes things like your communication and notification. Make sure it includes things like um, what data is going to be critical to collect and understand in those situations? Again, we've got a full checklist from, you know, what logs are we looking at? What users were on the systems? Were there any uh, immediate changes in privileges? Were there any anomalies in the event logs? What services are active on a server that appears to be compromised, right? Don't leave that to question about what data you're going to ask your system administrators and network administrators to gather. It, it can be a quick checklist, and this is the data we want. Here's where we want it sent. Here's who we need to notify. Um, and then, you know, always know who you can engage with um, if things get bad. Um, don't be worrying about contracts and, and statements of work in the last minute. Um, kind of understand what of your vendors are available to help with that because um, sometimes these can get out of control and when you if you potentially get in a situation where you're having to restore from scratch um, you're going to need some extra help and you and you don't want to delay that um, if you've got vendors at the ready to do that and what I encourage our customers to do is please involve us uh, in your testing in your your security incident plan so that we we can understand the roles that they're expecting us to play and that uh, that they're going to take on. Again, we've got a checklist that we run down. Um, not saying it's you know it's it's not 10 pages. It's a couple pages and it and it's always edited um, for different customers on what activities they're going to look for us to do with things like data recovery um, and analysis and in those types of activities versus what they're going to do. And a lot of times that comes down to certainly the communication protocols that they're going to handle. But I can't encourage you enough. Have a plan, especially, you know, be prepared with any kind of communications you're going to have to do. Make sure you've identified the key administrative tasks that you're going to ask your teams to perform. Uh, know who all in terms of your vendors that potentially need to be involved in it, either as a result of an activity or to help resolve the activity. Um, and and practice it at least yearly, even if it's just an hour to get a few key folks in a room. I guarantee you, you're going to uncover things, and it's a very worthwhile exercise. It's also it's a sweet way to improve your internal support mechanisms, right? You know, think about the model that Katie just described, where you're actually creating an IR plan, where whether it's legal or corporate or maybe the business units are going to have to play a role in what happens in the course of an incident. I have seen that IR planning process that Katie just described be one of the most effective forms of awareness training, I guess Jessica was just talking about, that exists. Because you say, listen, we're doing an IR plan. Here's what all of you are going to have to do when things go sideways. Suddenly, it's no longer the CISO or the director of IT who's going to get shot when this thing goes sideways. 
everybody's going to have a role to play. And they're going to see that role in advance. They can really be a, a very organic way to, to engender support and a kind of constructive business-oriented communication between the security team that they don't ordinarily get with the rest of the organization. So this is really great advice. And that kind of checklist that Katie describes can be a really fundamental way to improve communication about security beyond the IT. Thank you all so much. I think we've got a couple of more secret words to give out before we can get some questions from our audience. Malware is secret word number five, that's M-A-L-W-A-R-E. So secret word number five of six is malware. And the final secret word of the day is data. Secret word number six is data, D-A-T-A. -A. There's still time to get your questions in, ladies and gentlemen, using the chat window that you'll find on the right-hand side of your screen. Even though the questions won't appear, we will get through as many as we can with the time that we've got remaining. The first two questions, however, for yours truly. Our first secret word of the day, for those that may have missed it, was security, S-E-C-U-R-I-T-Y. And in terms of those secret words, you will be sent a brief survey after today's webcast that you'll need to type those secret words into. So if you've missed any of them, just send us an email, info at the knowledge group dot org. So that's the two questions for me. I've got a couple for the panelists as well. Um, our first question for today's panel. Uh, how do you garner funding to address security concerns that may occur? So how do you garner funding perhaps to deal with a hypothetical? Yeah, I'll take that one. So I think a key um, part of what we have done at TDF to try to garner that funding is ultimately, and, and this is where the, the control framework that we're talking about can help with that, so one of the key things that we did kind of early on in establishing our security practice was as we started to use this framework, we laid out, uh, we, we ultimately looked at each of these controls and we went through and we assessed what our risk level was associated with this. So we looked at what the likelihood of an occurrence was. And again, you've got to take into account the fact that things like ransomware, like we're dealing with here, they are rampant out there right now and they are all over the news headlines. So it is happening very actively. Um, and so what we did was we took a look at what the likelihood of an occurrence is, you know, so the probability, and again, these are very rampant attacks going on. And then we also looked at, um, you know, what the impact of a breach would be to us. And we said, here are the types of things that could happen, you know, so it could shut down the business for X period of time. And this is, this is actively what's happening. And we used this framework then to be able to communicate back to our executives and to be able to say, here's where we see our level of risk in the environment. So we see this as a high risk that if this occurred, this could have this type of impact to our organization. How could we handle, would we be able to handle multiple weeks, months um, of a scenario where we did not have access to our IT assets, where they were unreachable? Um, and, and we took that to our executives and said, here's, where we need assistance. We need to start by mitigating these. Again, if we if you look at the control control framework, I think Katie had spoken to the fact that there are different implementation groups per type and size of company. And so depending on the size of your organization, look at uh, group one, look at group two, look at group three, whichever is applicable to you. And I would encourage you to take those to your executives and, and show them really potentially even whether it's a dollar value of potential impact or even just a you know, talk to them in terms of the impact that it could have on your business. And that's really where we've seen the most progress in organiz organizations working to get funding. I don't know if anybody else has anything they want to add to that. I might just say that from a practical perspective, being able to identify peer organizations which have experienced the type of breaches you're concerned about can be a powerful tool to take to your management team. We don't want to look like XYZ, right? Because then it can be some you know, publicly shared data about how it went sideways. Uh, and also, you know, some, some firms like one that they can actually give you information about what peer organizations are doing, right? So, you know, you're doing pretty well, but these organizations are now focused on implementing you know, two factor authentication, or these organizations are doing 24 by 7 monitoring in a different way, you know? So sometimes being able to help your funding organization, you know, your executive team, your management team, your business unit, 
to better understand how people like them, who they may aspire to be like, or who they don't want to be losing business to, are doing it, it can be an effective tactic. Thank you so much. Uh, a question here from our audience. It's a two-part question. Uh, Towards the end of the presentation, uh, we discussed the idea of uh, a plan. Uh, how often would you suggest reviewing said plan? I know it was mentioned that uh, yearly was uh, was the way that, uh, that these plans are often reviewed, but is that best practice or perhaps quarterly would be better? And when it comes to planning and creating a checklist, are there any common areas that are often overlooked? Uh, I know you mentioned that it should go into even the communication of, of said issue. Perhaps that's something that's overlooked. So in summary, uh, how often should one review the plan when one is creating a plan or a checklist? Are there any areas that are commonly overlooked? Yeah, I can start there. So um, I would certainly encourage more if you can, because to Jack's point, it's a good tool for awareness and get buy-in. I do think where it's most effective is getting a cross-functional team together to really have the discussion. So if you can truly get that cross-functional team together on a quarterly basis, absolutely. That would be a great uh, mechanism to in, in, in format to, to do it in. Um, you know, I'm starting out what I think is reasonable because typically we, we get together um, yearly and a lot of our customers, uh, we get involved with them on a yearly basis. But if you can do it more frequently, um, and especially, you know, one of the areas that I didn't talk about is um, and it feeds into the second part of the question, is doing an after-action discussion, right? So you get through the incident, you've got uh, all these things that happen, right? Who documented that timeline and everything that happened? So then, then you can go back and look at it critically and say, here's where we should have done better. And you can absolutely do that as part of testing, right? You, you know, here we wanted to go get this data, but that data wasn't going to be available. So, you know, what's the actions we're going to take? And right back to Jack's point, right, those after action um, points can be what helps drive even funding because now everybody agrees, hey, we should have this data and we don't have this data. So I think it's a great question about, you know, what can be overlooked because once you get through an incident, especially if it's taken months to recover, the last thing you want to do is bring it back up again and talk through it. And that is very frequently overlooked, but incredibly important to make sure it doesn't happen again because we have had situations where customers have thought they have eradicated a uh, malware and they haven't only to have it reappear a few months later. And so had they gone through some of that after action planning, um, it could have very likely uh, addressed a lot of that. Thank you so much. And another question that we do have for our panel here from today's audience. Uh, can you recommend any best practices for some offline backups? Uh, the frequency, uh, the number of discrete backup sets to maintain the tools used, that sort of thing. So best practice for off-site backups. Yeah, I mean, certainly there's a lot of uh, vendors that we work with directly in providing that type of service. So I don't want to sound too biased, but you know, uh, Microsoft's got reasonable products in the in the cloud that help again with getting it off of your environment. Um, you know, we do our own backup, uh, leveraging different technologies and different storage systems. Um, I would certainly encourage you to to reach out to us at OneNet because I don't want to necessarily uh, fill the air with with um, with advertisement, but we would I would love to talk to you offline if you want to contact me. Yeah, and I think in addition to that, you know, I mean, there's everything from good old fashioned tape, you know, so if you think about it, tape is a, is a copy that's not, it's not like storage where, you, where it's physically addressable, but I know there's, uh, you know, there's it's kind of a bit of an older technology, but there's still currency to it as well. Um, but then most backup systems as well have, uh, many of them have added features over the years that allow you to make the uh, backup system is completely inaddressable or allow you to take the backups offline. So you could do the backup and then you can ultimately um, have it uh, scripted or configured to automatically go offline. So those are a couple of different options. Um, when it comes to, you know, numbers of copies, I think that, 
Um, you know, a key thing often that can be missed with backups is um, it's sometimes less about the number of copies and more about the integrity of the backup. And so organizations don't always necessarily test to validate that their backups are good. And when you get into a situation like this, you quickly find out if your backups are good or not, um, even if they're offline and if they're not valid backups and if you haven't tested to ensure that you can actually recover from that backup. I would say that that's probably a more even more critical process. Um, than necessarily the number of copies or anything along those lines. And so ensuring that the backup that you have taken and it's that backup that you take offline is actually um, able to recover and, and good to be used um, is an important step to not miss. Thank you so much. And a, and a point of clarification from uh, the audience member that asked that question, um, is that referring to uh, totally offline backups or just off-site? Um, so I, I think the key piece with it is that it needs to be offline because you can have a backup that's off-site but is still addressable or accessible from your network. And that's actually the case um, of, uh, I believe that um, in some in certain instances with this ransomware example that we gave, that company did have some of the systems at least backed up off-site, but they were still addressable from their network. And so that attacker gets domain admin access or they get access that allows them onto um, their backup system. And ultimately, they start by encrypting and destroying those backups. Um, and so the key is, is that the backup has to actually be non-addressable from your standard, especially your standard production network. Um, that is, that's important um, for continuity of secure in, in a security situation like this. That off-site backup is often important from a disaster recovery or similar type of perspective. But this is kind of a piece in addition to that. So it's off-site from a disaster recovery perspective and being able to recover from some sort of physical uh, disaster, um, but then offline or unaddressable from a, an ability to recover from some sort of either ransomware or security type attack. Thank you so much. And with the time that we've got remaining, I'd like to take a brief moment just to ask our panelists for their key takeaways or their final thoughts. Uh, Kate, we heard from, from you, or perhaps you want to lead us off with a few of your final thoughts from today presentation. Yep. So go out, check out the critical security controls. Just put two hours on your calendar. Um, if you don't have a framework or any kind of controls that you pay attention to, it, it just helps prioritize and, and think about what you should be doing ne next from a, a risk to your environment. Uh, document an incident plan. And, um, you know, we, we didn't talk about a lot, but in the boundary defense discussion, Whenever you're starting up a new project, um, security by design and, and thinking about these controls when you're implementing something new is a, a, an incredible time and cost-effective time to do it. Thank you so much. And Jessica, some takeaways from yourself as well, please. Yeah, I think the, a key takeaway that I would ask as well is, you know, kind of taking on to Katie, is when you look at those controls then, think about how to educate the other executives in your company, those who are uh, responsible for helping you get funding. Um, think about how to how to leverage this as a piece of, of a, a mechanism to help inform and educate in order to be able to get the assistance needed for you to really up your security game. Um, because it's you know all over the news. I'm sure that your executives are seeing that occur. That it's all over the news that this is happening day in and day out. We live it and breathe it. Um, and so use these as a way to try to get that, again, that common language that we've talked about to educate your executives, to try to get the support needed to move the needle in your organization. Excellent. And finally, Jackson, takeaways from yourself as well, please. Yeah, absolutely. The, the first thing I'd ask you, to, you all to do is to remember that the security is applied against the backdrop of the business you're trying to help out. Uh, and so as you're thinking about these controls, start by understanding what the business is trying to do. It's getting that visibility across not just all the assets, but all the functions that they're looking for and how the business is being run. Um, both Katie and Jessica said it perfectly well. Use this as an opportunity to share common language with business types, uh, business partners who may not necessarily understand all the geekliness of security. And don't hesitate to reach out for help. And help doesn't just mean you know, getting great technical advice you know, from, from folks like we're talking today about, uh, but also about how to communicate. What's an effective strategy? You know, you've got people like Katie who are successful at being CISOs who know how to have these conversations. So reach out, not just to understand what to do for tech, 
not just to understand what to do for tooling, but to understand how to have these conversations because they help us out. Thank you so much. And with that, that's about all we've got time for today. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes today's webcast, Data Security, Raising the Bar for the Mint Market. Now, if you do have a question intended for one of our panelists that perhaps we didn't get time for, you can contact them individually using the information found within your materials. Can't find that for whatever reason or have a question for us, just send us an email that addresses info at theknowledgegroup.org. You can also send us an email if you've missed any of today's secret words. And for those applying for continuing education credits, that survey is mandatory. You'll need to enter the secret words that were read earlier to satisfy that attendance requirement. Finally, you can follow the Knowledge Group across social media. We're found on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram for all the latest news and events information. You can also listen to our Knowledge Group podcast on iTunes and SoundCloud for the very latest about what our speakers intend to cover.